friends, welcome back to another episode of Casey Talks Critters. Every month I'm going to bring you a brand new episode where we highlight one specific animal and I bring you an expert who's going to talk about that animal. Um, so we're, like I said, every month we're going to have this new episode for you. So make sure you hit that notification bell so that you will be notified for the next episode. And we want you to subscribe to our channel and make sure you like it because we're going to keep making more videos. Um, so. Today, we are going to be talking about knobtail geckos with Joe Hupp. He is amazing. So he is an expert breeder. I mean, I, I don't even want to say gecko breeder because he's bred over 162 species of geckos and even more reptiles just in general. So like, we're going to get so much great information about knobtail geckos today. So welcome, Joe. Hello. Thank Hello. you for How's joining me. Going great. Um, so it was very great to work with you in St. Louis. We worked oh, yeah. at the Pangea booth together, and it was super fun. And I'm really happy to have you on the show today. Awesome. So I guess let's get started. So what is your experience with animals, and well, how did you get there? Uh, my mom told me I couldn't have lizards when I was a kid, so now I have three rooms of them. Uh, uh, that, that's basically like a little yeah. bit of the start. The other start is, uh, my dad was actually really cool with the animals. He grew up, um, with an appreciation for wildlife. So me and him used to go like hiking and we'd look for like turtles, identify birds, chase lizards, do stuff like that when I was a kid. Um, and that just kind of got me started in my first project. I think I was about 12 or 13. It was actually fish. Um, I did tropical fish for probably the first three or four years I kept animals. And then I kind of transitioned over to reptiles, which was a menagerie. It was a combination of snakes, lizards, turtles, tortoises, frogs, salamanders. Up until probably about 16 years ago, when I converted over to like almost all geckos. Uh, yeah, the only non-geckos in the collection is a group of star tortoises. Um, well, secret, I'm actually a turtle and tortoise guy disguised as a gecko guy. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Well, maybe we're going to have to do another Casey Talks sure. Critters episode on a yeah, tortoise. I had a for sure. dedicated collection of those for over a decade. Um, but the thing about turtles and tortoises is, like, if I'm going to keep something, I want to be able to keep it right. In the Midwest, it's just not a great place to be able to keep them because... I'd like to keep them outside where they get good natural UV, be able to do ponds, stuff like that. And mm -hmm. with our winters, the tropical species that I like, it's just not good for them here. So I do the star tortoises. I've got four UVB bulbs over about 70% of that enclosure with a hide, so they aren't always exposed to it. And yeah. That's awesome. Oh, man. I'm so excited. Geckos, tortoises, I'm so ready for this. This is so exciting. <laughs> so you've also um, had some experience. You you worked at um, a zoo, yeah. if I'm yeah, the, uh, correct, Saint right? Louis yeah. zoo. I was there for a few years while I was in college, um, and it was a really good experience. It was actually my first experience that really exposed me to stuff that was kind of, I guess, beyond the stuff that you could really get in the pet trade or, you know, what would be construed as a normal thing to work with, like Komodo dragons, seven species of crocodilians. It was the second largest venomous collection in the country. Um, a lot, a lot of really cool stuff. And back then, it was more of a menagerie. Zoos are really focused now on SSPs or species survival programs. Back then, they had a few. Yep. But it was basically like shotgun collections. Like if you went in a building back then, you'd see 100, 150 species in a building that big. Whereas now you'll see like 30-ish in most herpetariums. Mm -hmm. um, St. Louis still has more than that just because it's a massive one. I don't know if you've ever been to our zoo, but the bottom level of it is just as big as the top level. So the public areas, and there's actually behind the scenes in the perimeter of all the top. So it's, it's a massive view. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I'm definitely going to have to check it out the next time I'm in town for sure. Next NARBC, sure. got to go yeah. to the zoo. If you give me a little bit of a heads up, I can probably yeah. get you some behind the scenes there. I'll make a phone call. Yeah. Oh, 
I would love that. Oh my God. Casey Talks Critters hits the St. Louis Sioux, baby. <laughs> um, so let's talk about yeah. knobtail geckos. Why are they um, so cool? I like some of the more obscure type species. And in the last, I'd say 10 years, they've come a little bit more into the limelight, but they're an intermediate level species. So I don't think they're ever going to be as popular as like, crested or like leopard gecko stuff like that and that's cool that's fine um i would say i wouldn't start off with them for people that have never worked with them but if you've worked with species that require heat um basically what they really need is some moisture on the cool end a dry warm area and a hide over both and as long as both of those things can be consistently mm -hmm. provided the majority of the species are pretty tough um there's a few that are a little bit more sensitive, but they're one of those things you wait list for. They really don't pop up for sale, and they're in the thousands of dollars, so that's not something the general public would really need to worry about. Um, yeah, the ones I'd say are good for starting are like Nephorus wheeleri synctus, Nephorus wheeleri wheeleri, loosely a knobtail underwoodosaurus milli. It's been in the same genus in the past. Those are probably the toughest um for the general public i would say do one of the rough skin species before you do any of the smooth skin like levis is a common one people mm -hmm. see in the uh in like classifieds and articles and stuff the thing about levis is if they miss a shed they're pretty unforgiving on that whereas the wheeler eye you can kind of get that off of them same with the uh millie Interesting. Very cool, because there are so many different species of yep. knobtail geckos. Like, uh, how, ma how many are there? There's 13, there's... debatably 14, and potentially two more. Uh, Nephorus asper, I believe, either has been or is about to be busted up into three to four species. It was one before. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that amazing how, you know, as we research and, you know, the, it things change all the time we have new species all the time and it's it's these new classifications i yep. find it absolutely fascinating so yay more knobtail geckos i mean i know oh, they're sure. already here but we yeah, can in australia is huge. <laughs> i mean who knows what we may not have found because there's a few species that occur in like these teeny teeny tiny distributions i'm sure there's probably more out there we just mm -hmm. haven't run into yet because there's isn't it, that so cool? Is. That is so yeah. cool. <laughs> um, so for me, I don't have a lot of experience yeah. with knobtail geckos just from seeing them at shows. And like, I feel like the more shows I go to, there's more and more popping up. There's so many different kinds. And oh my God, they're so cute with their big eyeballs. Yeah. Oh, just, you know, that's, they're really cool little critters. And I, I'm so excited to learn yeah. about them. Um, so... What was your first knob? How long ago was your first knobtail gecko? <laughs> 16, give or take a year, about 16 years ago, I think. Uh, back then, they were attainable, yeah. but they weren't as common. Some of the species were pretty hard to get. Uh, the biggest one, also a rough knobtail gecko, is Nephorus amii. That's the largest terrestrial gecko in Australia. Um, and they're little bulldogs. They're, oh. They could basically eat some of the ones you've normally seen at shows. They're, they're pretty formidable. <laughs> they're pretty grumpy, yeah. too. Um, yeah, they're not... Oh, boy. Not tails, I would say, probably aren't the best animals to keep if somebody wants to have, like, a handleable type of pet. Um, they're more of, like, mm -hmm. a naturally occurring yeah. species that you set up a cool terrarium and appreciate. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. It's a display animal. It's you look. Yep. It's pretty to watch. Yeah. Absolutely. So, are they tricky to establish when you bring one home? I know we're going to talk about um, what type of keepers we say. You know, more of an intermediate or like yeah. advanced keeper. But what kind of methods do you use um, sure. when you bring one um, home? Well, the one thing that's across the board on them is, uh, I guess, explaining the habitat's the easiest way to explain the setup. Um, there's a lot of people out there when they're brand new and they figure it out pretty quickly. Usually 
Um, they assume that a desert reptile just needs heat. It's dry in the desert. But most of the animals that live in a desert are seeking moisture. So, like, these species live in burrows. So, what I do is I keep, like, a little moist box of sand on the cool side. And I spray down the cool side three times a week so they have something to drink. Um, and they'll basically just use that to kind of burrow down into. Um, for people that want to breed them, it also makes it easy to find the eggs. Because all you have to do is just lift the tub up and look from the bottom. And if they've laid eggs, you'll just see them buried to the bottom of it. And you just kind of gently dig them out. Um, but yeah, desert species definitely need moisture. Leopard geckos can be a little bit more forgiving on that. Um, some of the other ones who spend most of their time down in burrows, like a lot of species in Australia that are burrow living in Southern Africa, um, they really, really need that moisture. And if they don't get it, it's not something that you see go bad right away, but it's a gradual downhill that when it hits bad, goes bad fast. So, yeah, moisture, yeah, moisture yeah. on the cool end. The warm end on all but two species of it, you're safe in like the high 80s, low 90s. Um, yeah, and yeah, the two species cool. I'm talking about that are going to be more varied, uh, they're from different types of habitat, and they're not quite as common. Like Nephorus delanii, uh, Nephorus stellatus. Um, I'd also put Nephorus lavissimus in there. Like stellatus, if you try and keep that like a regular knob tail, it's absolutely going to fail. They're actually from a pretty cool environment. So I keep the rack for those in the same room as my uh, Europlatus, where it's cool. And they just have an isolated hot spot in the mid-80s. And they actually do well and they breed well. They're considered to be a trickier species. And I don't really think mm -hmm. that there's any species that I've worked with anyway that's like super, super tricky. It's just knowing what to do, the couple of parameters that animal needs, and actually doing it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know. Yeah. Because yeah, it's, it's on a big scale. You know, some species are so tough that they can tolerate so much. Like, for example, in New Caledonia in the summer there, if you look up the weather charts online, it can get into the low 90s. Mm -hmm. um, it's regularly in the upper mm -hmm. 80s. But people in captivity, you know, mm -hmm. assume that that's going to kill the gecko. If you... If it's used yeah. to that, if it's been raised in the low 70s its whole life, it's not going to adapt to those high temps immediately. But like mine, my gecko yeah. room with the New Caledonians in it, it reaches mid 80s in the summer. Mm -hmm. And I give the uh, lychees and yeah. the lesser trackies an actual hot spot, the kahua too, um, in the low 90s. And the females will yeah. actually go under it and they'll actually thermoregulate. Mm -hmm. um, I think. Yeah, I actually, our Chihuahua gecko, I have witnessed, like, yeah, basking, or what, like, I feel like it's basking, and I'm like, oh, look at you, like, you, you're getting Absolutely. all toasty in there, yeah. like, and, and they're, they're yeah. tough enough that they awesome. can, most New Caledonian geckos, they're tough enough that they can tolerate temperatures outside of what they've evolved in, but you'll kind of notice that mm -hmm. they get a little swollen, they're not quite as healthy they, uh, if you saw crested mm -hmm. geckos about 20 years ago, a little past that when they came in, if you dumped crickets in with a crested gecko, it was like any other predatory species. They would pinpoint straight to it. There was no waiting. There was no flopping. There was no dropping. Straight on it and they'd eat it. Um, now they kind of hop or flop or make a couple of jumps to it from what I've seen. So I'd, I would recommend, and I know some people fight me on this, but I'd up the temperatures on those. And the reason that I bring up the New yeah. Caledonian yeah. geckos is they're the most tolerant of not being in an environment that they've evolved to, um, as opposed to mm -hmm. some other species like Strophurus or the knobtails we're talking about, or the genus Nephurus. They have a much more narrow window of being within the habitat that they come from um, in order to thrive. So there's kind of yeah. a trend in the last decade of people asking, do I have to put heat on it? Yes, and by the way, yes. Um, yeah. 
those guys have to have it. Um, if they can't thermoregulate, they won't digest. They won't be able to perform normal metabolic yeah. functions, and they'll they'll roll. They won't survive. So. Absolutely. There's a big difference between surviving and thriving. There we is. talk about it all yeah. the time. We want our animals to thrive. We want to provide them whatever we physically can to make it as, to make them have a happy life because they're going to be with us for a long time. So we got to make sure that they're well taken care of. Absolutely. Do you think they're going to be any, well, at least the knobtail geckos, do you think they're going to get any bigger in the future? No. With more, I think they've kind of plateaued. I, I think they're about where they're going to be. The hobbyists that want to deal with species mm -hmm. that require, um, I wouldn't say challenging for those. They're not like, they're not like super complicated, but the people that want to be able to provide dedicated racks or heat sources and things like that and go to all insects because that's all they're going to eat is live stuff. Um, you know, they're, they'll definitely uh, they'll definitely need heat. Um, probably the easiest way to keep them is racks, but they work just as fine in like planted up tanks, as long as it's more of a uh, not tropical, but like a, a desert loamy kind of thing. But like I said before, like a drier end and a moist end. Yeah. Yeah. So this actually kind of goes into my next question. Because this is a Zen Habitat show, does Zen make an enclosure that you think would be appropriate? I'm sure for you guys do. Um, for most of the knobtails, <laughs> what you're really looking for is something that's at least about the smaller ones, 18 inches long by about a foot wide or bigger. Um, for a few of the bigger ones, mm -hmm. you're looking more like two feet long by 12 to 18 inches wide. So I'm sure you guys make a cage that fits within yeah. that wall. Yeah, yeah. We have, well, we have our two by two by two cubes. And then we, for our terrestrial guys, if we wanted to do a little bit bigger, we have a four by 16 inch by two foot enclosure. It's going to be kind of big. Well, people can <laughs> use uh, heat bulbs, like overhead heat for knob tails. You just generally, what I like to do is um have you seen those like ceramic or rock or clay caves you can buy in like pet stores what i would do is put the heat spot over that yeah. because they actually kind of absorb the heat mm -hmm. um, and that's the reason i do yes. uh, yeah. a hide on the warm end and a hide on the cool end that way because that animal it's nocturnal mm -hmm. um i should have mentioned that before they kind of don't want to come out during the day very often so it has an option for if mm -hmm. the room feels too cool it can hide under the warm end or if not, it can just hide yeah. under the cool end if the room feels too warm. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like our Zen cave would be really great for this too, because it is um, the cave comes with a slate top, oh, nice. so you put it under that heat, and then it'll get nice and toasty in there. So like, I really love it for bearded dragons because they'll like bask on it, you know, nice warm belly. But for these burrowing guys, if you some like kind of submerge that cave into your dirt a little bit, it'll create a nice warm den for them. And I think that would be so great. I think we went over some really great stuff there. We're gonna kind of segue into some questions from our fans. So you had mentioned that they eat, they're insectivorous. What are some good feeder for, insects? Uh, for for my guys? breeders, for the most part, I use Dubia. Um, it has a little bit better nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also throw in hornworms once in a while and crickets once in a while. They're not really picky about what they're eating as long as it's moving. Um, for the ones that I raise to sell to the general public, I utilize crickets, though. And the reason why is yeah. dubia for most knobtails. It's kind of like if you put a cheeseburger or you put a grilled chicken sandwich in front of me, nine times out of ten, I'm going to want the cheeseburger. Um, and yes. not the best analogy, I guess, because the dubia do have more nutrition than the crickets. Um, it depends on what you feed mm -hmm. them too, yeah. but they just naturally do. Um, you really, yeah. it's hard to get a lot of knobtails to stop eating them once they start. So that's why I do the crickets on gotcha. the one for the general public, because most of the general public doesn't have access to keeping a colony of dubia yeah. in an apartment they may have or even wanting to bring roaches in you know they're just as fun as the crickets but yeah, no, i get the general yeah. public's you know kind of opinion on dubia stuff yeah i'm right there i understand completely i am definitely yep. a dubia girl i 
I don't like crickets in my house. I don't like hearing them chirp. Oh, I don't like the way they sure. smell. <laughs> um, but but they are so readily available for a lot of people, um, in especially certain states and even our country where you can't even oh. get dubia roaches, that they're illegal in your yeah. state. So that makes a lot yeah. of sense to stick with the crickets. Yeah. Okay. So um, you said that there's a wide, you know, 14 right now. We'll see. 13, maybe 14, um, different species. What is our size sure. range um, between our smallest um, and our biggest? The smallest is probably uh, Lavisi. Um, on a lot of the knob, not all, okay. but a lot of the knobtail species, the males are about half the size of the female. The males are actually smaller. Um, on Delaney, I would say, trying to match up to my phone here, about that big. Whereas Amy I would be, I mean, Amy I would be big. They'd be bigger, bigger. Yeah. Um, trying to wow. think of something that that's... would be kind of analogous to the size of an Amy I that's in the trade. This is going to be way off base because it's a mammal. There's just nothing shaped like an Amy I because they have this short, tiny tail, but this giant, robust body. Um, like about hamster size. Yeah. <laughs> um, not really a reptile, but okay. everybody knows what, yeah. you know, an adult hamster is. Yeah. You know how big a hamster is. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's what we do as Americans. We we choose sizes of things, like, so sure. strangely. Like, that deer weighs yeah. 800 cheeseburgers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that. No, that's great. So, I think we went over like a lot of really great knobtail information. I want to ask you some more questions about your um, your journey and your career because um, what I like to do in this segment of the show is I had a lot of mentors and I still have a lot of mentors. I'm still learning every day and I want to provide this sort of information for our fans who also are interested in potentially breeding or you know getting into the animal space in a different um, capacity. So you give someone who wants to pursue a career similar to yours i would say just do it i mean it's i there's i'll go over like briefly um like advantages and disadvantages of it um you yes, know I love that. Yeah. the advantages i think far outweigh the disadvantages um i don't have a boss uh for people who don't know i breed full-time <laughs> I is an individual and there's nothing wrong with having employees. I choose to do it solely. About three rooms is what I can do full time. Um, mm -hmm. I want the geckos that I'm producing and selling to come from me. I have friends that I've known for a long time that they eventually get to a point where they have other people taking care of their animals for them and all they're dealing with is the general public. And for me, I'm doing it because I'm into the geckos and I want to deal with the geckos. And the general public school, too. That's fine. It just, I don't want to get to a point where I'm not doing the geckos. So I've capped the size that my business is going to be. I'm happy where it's at. Um, good advice for rookies. And I've actually killed some sales for myself telling people this before. Um, know how much time you have versus how much animals you have. Um... I primarily work, right now it's about five, six hours a night, um, about six nights a week, um, which is good for me. Yeah. You know, I, I have a daughter that's nine years old, so I go down in the gecko rooms after she goes to bed because she has to go to sleep relatively early because she has school in the morning. And then I just work the gecko rooms like third shift, and then I crash, get her to school, come home, go back to sleep. And then I have the rest of the day to kind of relax, pick yeah. her up. Um, but owning your own business, yeah. whether if it's geckos or anything else, it gives you more freedom like that. Um, I think the more you complicate it, the more people you bring into it, because I've run other people's businesses successfully. Having employees complicates things 10 times. Your taxes, which you have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's just not my path. It's just not the way I want to roll with it. Because I have lots of friends that are into reptiles. If I want to socialize with people, like my buddy Nick, um, he does his gecko room the same time I do mine. So we'll just I'll just put on my mm -hmm. headphones and I either talk to my friends, uh, listen to podcasts, music, 
you know, YouTube, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, but, yeah it's just good vibes, good vibes, yeah. and you enjoy what you like. So like, you enjoy what, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah. you enjoy what you do. I would do. say if somebody like... wants to do a small business, um, think about what you're doing, what your expenses are, what your profit margin's probably going to be. Don't count on your profit margin to be 100%. Count on it to be about 70%, and you'll end up being a little bit over that. Uh, because if you have a 1,000 mm. gecko eggs in a year, not every single egg is going to hatch, just like not every person's born, not every animal in the wild is going to be born. You know, some, some things are going to be born Absolutely. with issues. It's a very small percentage, but it happens. Some years you'll have projects like this year in my Ebenawi, I sold off half mm -hmm. the adults um, just because it blew the mm -hmm. door off. I mean, I produced over a hundred of them. My goal is forty. So, but you'll have other <laughs> you'll have other it's projects funny. too, like Nephrus Asper. That's tricky. Some years you may get you know four mm -hmm. clutches and hatch them all. Some years you might get nothing. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Other good yeah. advice: if yeah. people want to do geckos full time. Um, if you want to work with just a couple of things, build your reputation because there's probably a lot of other people selling that one or two things and your reputation is what's going to sell it, not just putting it on a table or posting it in a classified. Um, mm -hmm. For me, because I like the natural diversity of geckos, it's a little easier because like, say I'm vending a large show and... There's literally 25 other vendors there that have New Caledonian geckos, and there's five vendors that have leopard geckos. There are a lot of people coming through the door looking for that, but there's only so many people. Mm -hmm. There's also only so many people looking mm -hmm. for cave geckos, Australian leaf tails, Madagascan leaf tails. And if you have a larger variety of things when people come in, you're hitting all those crowds instead of just one or two of them. Um, so I, I really yeah. rarely have a bad show. And advice for, and it's understandable yeah. for people that are new that get frustrated if they have a bad first show or two. Understand that if you're not making sales right off the bat, it might be just because people don't know you. And a lot of my customers are regulars. If you're having a like a bad fiscal show if you're not making money then your thing to focus on is walk around the room talk to some people get a friend to do the show with you so you can get out from behind your table figure out who has what you want in that room if you're not making sales you might as well make trades and expand your collection without dropping cash out of your pocket and work on building some other things up too you know whether if it's the same of whatever it is that you dig or other stuff it's an opportunity. Uh, you know, if you've been to 100 shows, yeah. Yeah. most of them are going to be good. On occasion, you're going to have a couple of bad ones just because that's how the odds roll, you know. Mm -hmm. But the longer you do it, the better they're going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And making trades at shows is so good, especially if you have a colony of breeders and opening up your oh, yeah. genetic lines from other breeders is so important. So that. I, that's really, yeah, really I great mean, advice. Preferably sure. different bloodlines is good. With some species, it's not possible. So outcrossing, getting as much other animals that you're not putting back to the same ones can also be helpful. There's some circumstances where projects mm -hmm. just need to be let go, too. Um, you know, if new diversity yeah. hasn't come in in a project in a long time and those problems start popping up, um, like they also can in a few mm. leopard gecko morphs and at least, and I don't know ball pythons well, but at least one ball python morph I know, or a naturally occurring species if you haven't gotten a new bloodline. Sometimes it's okay to just let go, you know. Sometimes it's better to just uh -huh. let that yeah. species disappear because it's doing fine in the wild. Um, hopefully, you know, I mean, there are environmental concerns with some species, but... If it goes in captivity in the hobby, it's not an environmental factor because from working in zoos, mm -hmm. I can tell you that it's not easy for zoos to re-release some animals into the wild. 
for people in the hobby to be able to do it, it's, it's probably not going to be a thing that's going to happen anytime soon because in somebody's personal collection, they have animals from different parts of the world that can carry different pathogens, which can be carried mm -hmm. in species that aren't used to carrying that. Whether if it's overt and they're showing symptoms and having problems, or sometimes just carrying it and it doesn't affect them, but it can affect other species in that biome, which is one of the reasons zoos are, you know, yeah. pretty careful about that. There's some amphibian projects I know of in several mm -hmm. zoos where they have dedicated rooms that that's the only species that goes for that room. And if you're a keeper, it's mm -hmm. either the first one you do in the beginning of the day. So you're not exposed to other stuff and then that room. Um, you know, so yeah. I, I don't think environmental factors yeah. is as sad as it makes me to say it because a lot of people really want to do that in the hobby. Um, if you want to do that, I'd connect with mm -hmm. the zoo and maybe see if you can help with them, volunteer, maybe even pursue a career if it's something you want to mm -hmm. do. Um, you know, or field research, that's mm -hmm. good too. I know... Pangea, John that works for Pangea, he's been out to Southern Africa, he's been to New Caledonia, New Zealand, um, he can tell you more of the places he's yeah. been to than me, yeah. but it's, uh, it's an impressive list, John's been to a lot yeah. of cool places, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think that's really great. Like, if you can, if you, conservation is what you're into and you're passionate about a species and you can make that your career. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. You I, just, for I can't it. imagine Absolutely. taking care of the same type of animal every night <laughs> for, like, changing paper towels for hours and hours on end and more power to anybody that wants to do that. Nothing wrong with it. It just, mm -hmm. I don't know, it might be my ADHD mm -hmm. brain, but... I just, I can't over focus on one thing for that long. I've got to have different things to focus on. Yeah. I, I can definitely relate with that. And I think that's why I thrived in veterinary ER and in um, wildlife rehabilitation because every day is yeah. different. And yeah. And I think that's, yeah. So I can definitely relate to that for sure. So. Is there a myth about your profession that you want to debunk? Going back to the New Caledonian thing, um, they, I think originally yeah. people told people house, you know, room temperature um, because it's a selling mm -hmm. point. But room temperature is so varied yeah. between different people. Um, you know, it, I, not yeah. my thing. Um, you know, they'll survive it. They no. will. No. Um, you know, another thing mm -hmm. I think, uh, on that is like the powdered diets. I think that you have good nutrition. I do utilize them, but all of my new Caledonian geckos, yeah. I also give live vertebrates or invertebrates to because my theory, and I could be yeah. wrong, but my theory is they, and this is true. This is not a theory in the wild. They do eat other lizards. They do eat vertebrates. They're eating mm -hmm. live, harder, crunchier things. And they have different dentition than us, but I can't imagine living my whole life off of a milkshake. Um, I don't know if it's good for their <laughs> jaws necessarily or their teeth to not get that, you know. Cause like, I've had adult lychees I've gotten from other people's collections, and I'm trying to give them, like, a calcium-dusted mm -hmm. pink. Um, and I put it up to their snout mm -hmm. on some pincers. And what I'll do is I'll dust them in the uh, the powder diet, the Pangea that I feed them, the feeding insect, just to give them oh, a yeah. familiar scent. Mm -hmm. And they'll like lick yeah. it, like they're trying to eat it, and they're shoving their snout against it. And they like don't get the concept for the first two or three times. They just need to open their mouth to actually be able to eat it. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, but then eventually, they don't eventually have any get it, else. you know. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I, I actually, I think that's very good because I do believe in variation for most yeah. species when it comes to diet. And yeah. no, that's a very good theory because I know that's what they eat in the wild, but you know that it does raise a question. Is it changing the morphology of their jaw structure or yeah. their musculature, like muscular, musculature, yeah. I can talk real yeah. good. Um, <laughs> well, you bring up a good point with that too, because I know this is on knobtails, but 
with like uh, New Caledonia Jack was also especially lychees. Like a while, most of the island ones, in the exception of New Amie and New Anna, because they're the smallest. Most of the uh, like bayonets or brassy or moro, those are typically around 120 to 150 grams in the wild, maybe pushing 170. Mm. In captivity, they're like north of 250. Um, I think it's the high sugar content diet and not enough protein. Um, that's why, like, when I make uh-huh. my mix yeah. for them, I like the uh, Pangea fig and insect because there's primarily three fruits that they eat in the wild, and they're all really high in fiber, mm-hmm. which fig is. And figs are actually one of those three. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it's a different variety, but it's probably mm-hmm. very similar. Um, so what I do is I take yeah. a blender and I put that mix in. I throw a little extra calcium with no D3 mm-hmm. in. I throw about a dozen crickets and a few mm-hmm. hornworms for some more protein. And I blend that. That way, if I have a tricky one or an odd one that isn't going for the inverts that I put in with it, um, it's naturally getting more protein through that shake. I know all of them are at that point. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that's brilliant. I, I love that. That is, so we're yeah. here about knobtails, but we're getting all <laughs> the New Caledonia <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm I'm for it. I'm loving it, and I think our fans are really going to appreciate sure. it too. So thank you. Um, so okay, I got a couple yep. more questions for you. So what is the biggest challenge that you're facing in your current role or project, and what how are you handling um, that? I will go over challenges <laughs> I've had in the past. Because, I mean, after doing this for 30 years and having been in business for a little over a decade and a half, I've got everything pretty pretty smoothed out. Um, You know, I I would say one thing when I was younger, um, I really wanted to just breed all the species. Um, So it's good advice for people on that is watch how much space, time, and funds you have when you're younger. Um, to the collection you have because it can your desire can outgrow your resources when it comes to a collection and I'm guilty of that myself when I was younger self admittedly Um, I had the funds to take care of stuff because I worked a full time job I went to school and I had a collection because I'm kind of nuts like that if I'm not doing something I get bored fast um it's, it's our ADHD yeah, brains. I get it. Literally. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I I would say keep track of how much stuff you have. Pace it, you know. Make yourself not add more than, mm-hmm. you know, another species or more of the same thing. Like every two or three months. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of gauge when you're at a point where you feel comfortable with the amount of time it takes to take care of the collection. Um, because what I did mm-hmm. at one point, I had... I want to say about 113 species, not all geckos, at a max. And I could handle it, but the problem was is it was seven nights a week. And it was like eight to ten hours a night, mm-hmm. seven nights a week, zero days off. And it just yeah. it gets to a point where you're going to get burnt out. And then I did what everybody did. I drastically oh, sure. reduced the collection and then let it build back up from that point. Mm-hmm. But I knew what the stopping point was after overdoing it the first time. Oh, and always have sense, reserves cause... because yeah. if you keep a number of animals, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have to take them to the vet. You're going to run into bills. Mm-hmm. Um, so keep some money aside. Mm-hmm. I do in an envelope and just say it doesn't exist. And then when that pops up, it's already there. Uh, for anybody that gets into this mm-hmm. as a business... <laughs> Keep every single receipt you get, including your vet bills, because it's a partial deduction come the end of the year, come tax time. Absolutely. Keep those receipts. You write that stuff oh, yeah. off 100%. Yeah. So, so, like, the average <laughs> tax rate on most small businesses as an individual is between 38 to 42%, depending on the state that you're in. And that sounds like a lot, but by the time you write off your cricket yeah. bill the caging you had to buy that year, or the few animals you had to get to add in, you know, all the expenses, the vet bills, everything that pops up, it ends up coming out to about the same as a payroll tax for me. 
Um, you're going to pay taxes. You just have to know to put a little aside as you go throughout the year. And for anybody that wants to do this full time, yes. also keep in mind that where you're at in the country, because like I'm in Missouri, so I'm kind of in the Midwest. So my summers get hot enough that I'm shut down from shipping for about two months. And my winters are cold enough that I'm shut mm -hmm. down from shipping for about two months. So know in advance yeah. that you need to start putting that money aside. That's why like the October Tinley is just perfect timing for me. Uh, because I just shove half that money mm -hmm. aside and don't touch it um, for the next couple of months because mm -hmm. it's coming up pretty soon after that that it's going to be too cold to ship. Yeah. Yeah. If you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, that's a list. Uh, <laughs> I would agree with the 18-year-old. It can be anything. Um, it could be like a personal life advice or it could be work related. I would, I would say, uh, well, I did, but keep the good friends that you have then. I'm still friends with a lot of the people I knew in junior high and high school. Um, it's. I think oh, friends awesome. are a super important thing in life, you know, for you to be there for them and for them to be there for you. It's, it's crucial. Um, I would have started my business a lot sooner. I'm glad that I did the zoo, um, but I did a lot of other jobs in between, like bartending, waiting tables. I ran a few small businesses, pest control company, worked for a medical lab. Um, you know, oh yeah, yeah. well, and I'm stuff. 48, so I had various jobs from 16 and up until I was, you know, late 30s, so... Early 40s, actually. Yeah. yeah, early 40s. So, yeah, a lot of good experiences. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's good to do different things. But I would have started doing what I'm doing now if I know what I know now back then. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because the, the downside is in the summer. Um, you've got eggs being laid, hatchlings you're taking care of, so the size of the collection grows astronomically, and it's a lot more work. But transversely, in the winter... Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got things, because a lot of the species I have have to be hard-cooled. Um, mm -hmm. In the summer, there's some weeks I am working about 60 hours a week. Average in the rest of the year is about oh, yeah. 30. But when things are on cool and their metabolisms are down and there's not much left from last year, it's probably like 15 hours a week, which is nice because it's a good break. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you get to enjoy your time, and you get to spend time oh, with yeah. your daughter. That's really awesome. Yeah, she's got as so many hobbies as me, too, I so I keep that. up with that. So, yeah. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Oh. So, yep. my last question. What's one question you wish I would have asked, mm. and how would you have answered um, it? Say, I'll just throw some some blanket advice out there on, uh, on gecko yeah, keeping. I love it. Um, you know, work with what you like if you do this as a business, uh, because I've seen a lot of people that go, oh, well, that's going to make money and this is going to make money and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, yeah, but I know you and you don't dig such and such reptile. And now you have two thirds of your collection is that. And then they end up being unhappy with it. Um, I did this full time for a couple of reasons. I did it because I enjoy it as a hobby, and life is very short. Um, time's non-refundable. You don't get a year, a day, an hour, a minute back. So what you get out of it is what you get out of it, and that's mm -hmm. it. Um, so I choose to live my life in a way where I'm doing things that I want to do and not necessarily things that I have to do. And I would say for the people that are doing things that you have to do and you don't want to be doing, you might not be able to change it overnight, but get a plan together. Make sure it actually makes sense that it's going to work. And if you can, if you have the means to go for it, go for it. If you don't work on it little bit by little bit, trade by trade, or whatever it is that you want to do, just eventually get to a point where you can do it because you can work just as hard for somebody else building their dream, or you could work just as hard building your own. So I would say build your own. Yeah. Do what you want to do and live your life. Yeah, that's beautiful advice. 
honestly like that is that's great and i love the your time is not refundable that is something that is something i actually read like earlier this week too and i was like yes you cannot get that back. You need to invest your time in important yeah. things. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't look at things as <laughs> I'll put it off till tomorrow kind of a thing because you put things off till tomorrow, yeah. half that stuff yeah. never gets done, you know. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Guilty. <laughs> we all do. We all do. Yeah. Oh, Joe, this was a great episode. I'm so happy that you were able to sit down and chat with me. We talked about so many cool things. Um, I think our fans are really going to enjoy this episode. So if you enjoy this episode, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell. I'm doing this once a month and maybe we'll do it more frequently. And it sounds like Joe's going to have some more animals for us to talk about. So stick around. We'll have more episodes.